Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth in the Mothership keyboardist, producer, composer, and arranger, Jeff Bova. After early on working with Ica iconoclastic producer Bill Laswell, Herbie Hancock, and the R&B band Change, he went on to lend his talents to a cavalcade of rock, pop, and R&B stars, including earning a Grammy producing Celine Dion in 1996. Other collaborations include Robert Palmer, Yoko Ono, David Lee Roth, Billy Squire, Billy Joel, Eric Clapton, Hall & Oates, Jody Watley, Chaka Khan, Meat Loaf, Vanessa Williams, Joe Cocker, Cindy Lauper, R. Kelly, Cher, Michael Bolton, Brian Wilson, Tina Turner, Michael McDonald, Star Point, Average White Band, Curtis Blow, Maceo Parker, Bootsy's Rubber Band, Bootsy, and uh, <laughs> Bad Company, Iron Maiden, and Joe Bonamassa. Jeff, thank you for joining me. How are you? <laughs> Great, thanks. Great to be here, Scott. Oh, so good to have yeah. you. Where are you today? Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm based. I'm based here. Yep. I'm in my studio uh, in Hollywood. Oh, nice. Yeah, I miss it. I'm from L.A. originally, but I've been away from there for about 16 years now. Oh, right. That actually, we must have done a switch. I, I came out here uh, like, well, 18 years ago now. Oh, we yeah. could have swapped, you know, apartments or houses or something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Although you came from uh, Connecticut at that time or where? Uh, no, actually from New York. I grew up in Connecticut and then uh, lived my old professional life in New York. Okay, so yeah. uh, you must have taken to LA pretty well. You've been out there a long time now. Yeah, it took me a while to get adjusted. You know, I was still hardcore New Yorker for five or six years, and then it just kind of came over me. I realized I could. I realized I was living here in LA. So, uh, you know, once I let go of my New York ishness, I was I was great. But I, I, I love it out here. Lifestyle's great. Lots of space, and uh, and the business is is still really good out here. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things I miss besides some of the restaurants is the business being out there, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the tours when they're happening, which thank goodness are coming back again. Um, you know, L.A. is a little more of a hot spot than than Charlotte, North Carolina, but. That's right, how it goes. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've been a fan for so long, so glad we could finally connect. And, you know, I was looking 
had so many uh, albums over the years. You know, I've always been, you know, liner notes, uh, you know, uh, junkie, if you will. And, you know, seeing sure. your name and thinking, ah, oh, he's on this, he's on that. Man, who is this guy? You know, and so <laughs> we're going to get to the bottom of that today. Awesome. Awesome. I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Fantastic. So, Jeff, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about how you uh, came to music? I know your father was a trumpet player and uh, of some acclaim, and you also initially uh, gravitated to trumpet and then keyboard. So could you kind of get us up to speed on that? Yeah, you know, in, in, in the beginning, uh, my, my dad's a professional trumpet player. He's retired now, but uh, still plays. And uh, he, was, uh, he was in the, uh, the Air Force jazz band based out of Washington, which was the Glenn Miller uh, band that was originally, uh, uh, you know, ran out through World War II. And they reactivated what they call the Airmen of Note. So he got his career start in the Air Force. And after that, uh, that's, that's where I was born in Washington, D.C. So I was like born right in it. And uh, uh, my parents moved to New York and then Connecticut, where I eventually grew up. But he was uh, totally involved in, in the biz in New York as a player. And he, uh, he was playing everything from Broadway shows, Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and uh, a lot of ballet work and TV, uh, TV work, uh, jingles, the whole thing. So I was brought up in that atmosphere. And my sister at the same time was uh, playing piano. So we were all, we all were the, the music majors and we just had music totally in, in, the, uh, in the home. So it was really just our, was totally surrounded by it. So there really didn't seem to be like anything else existed for us except for uh, music and all that, all that it brought. Um, I, was, I learned piano first and then trumpet uh, when I was like around like, you know, seven, seven, eight, eight years old and played both all the way through high school. Uh, but with keyboards, I, I, after hearing the Beatles, I was all into, into the Beatles and rock and roll at that point. So classical piano, I put aside and just wanted to play rock. So that was my, uh, you know, that's where it really seed started for me as, as a keyboard player. I love trumpet and I love what my dad did and just amazing music for trumpet. And I was involved in school orchestra bands, marching bands, the whole thing. But um, and I went as a trumpet major to uh, Berkeley School of Music and Manhattan School of Music. And uh, but at the time I was making all my money playing in, in bands. Uh, so uh, my second year at Manhattan, I talked to my teacher about it and said, you know, I'm, I've just got to sign a record deal with a band and, you know, I'm going to be playing keyboards. And he, and he said, hey, you know, the, the, uh, the room for brass players these days is getting less and less. And he was the uh, principal trumpet player in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. He says, I've got the best trumpet chair in the world <laughs> and I'm not giving that up too soon. <laughs> so, uh, so he said, you know, really, if you, you know, follow your heart there with, with that. So I uh, started with a band called Flying Island, or signed the Vanguard Records, the, the two albums there. It was like a jazz rock fusion, classical rock kind of band. And that's really where I got my start in the industry. Well, you know, so going to keyboards over trumpet, you know, it's not quite as mobile. You know, it's got like pros and cons on both sides. You know, the trumpet is so mobile and easy comparatively. But the keyboard is so much more versatile and integral in so many more types of music. Exactly. Uh, and I loved, I was, loved Hammond organ. And despite the size of one, you know, and it was just about the power of that beast to me was, uh, you know, similar to me, like, you know, how, how guitar did a certain kind of thing. Uh, you know, Hammond organ for me was where I could express myself in a really powerful way. So, uh, you know, I, I, lo I loved, loved all, the, all the music and great players, you know, John Lord, Keith Emerson, all those kinds of heroes. And then later, you know, got into, you know, more of the you know, jazz players, Brian Auger and players like that. Yeah. Yeah. So did you get to see many of them actually perform, uh, you know, before you got into a band or right, you know, around when you got into a band? No, no, I, not, not at that time. It was uh, growing up in Greenwich. We had a few bands would pass through, but it wasn't until uh, the Capitol Theater in Portchester opened up where I started to get to see a lot of great bands live. Uh, Leon Russell, um, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra, which again was such a 
you know, just the whole spin around to like, what just happened to music here? And uh, saw Tony Williams uh, as well. Actually, they were, they, were on the, uh, they were on the same bill. And that, that might, was mind blown at that point. So that's where I started, you know, going into, you know, pro, you know, progressive rock and jazz rock fusion. So when you got in uh, the first band and you cut some records, you know, what were sort of your aspirations at that point? What were you thinking in terms of your career in music? Well, I thought I was going to become the next Jan Hammer <laughs> or, or somewhere, somewhere along those lines. And um it, but I was so, uh, I had such a background in classical music that it was an interesting kind of blend of, of the very quirky, uh, the, they were even calling it Bartok rock. But, uh, you know, at that time, it really, yeah, we didn't really, we had the two albums, we really weren't uh, getting any traction. So, uh, so after that, I, I was trying to figure out what to do. So I went back to taking private composition and uh, arranging lessons and started playing in a couple of cover bands for a while there and playing a lot of disco and funk. <laughs> you got a re so you got a good reality check early on. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great experience, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, at that point having to make a living and uh, find a, a new direction. And while I was doing that, um, you know, playing in cover bands, that's when uh, the Prophet 5 and the Oberheim OBX came out. So that was when I just said, okay, this is amazing. This is life-changing here. So I got an Oberheim OBX. I sold the Hammond organ, believe it or not, <laughs> and, and started playing, uh, start playing bands with the, uh, with the synth. So this is like 70, I, 78, 70... 78, yeah, 78. So a couple of years doing that, and, and then I got, uh, that's when I got introduced to Change. They were looking for a synth player to complement the main keyboard player in the group for their uh, their road work. How'd you actually so, uh, meet, how'd you actually meet those guys? Though it was actually a referral. Uh, a keyboard player played with R Roberta Flack, Pete Canarosi, uh recommended me for the gig. Uh, they had approached him first because he was like one of the you know New York synth guys, and uh, uh, he wasn't available. He was doing the Roberta Flack gig, so he uh, he put me. At, Put me in touch with them and i went down auditioned um uh, with the band and for fred petrus and um got the gig you know so i was i was in the world of change uh, and, uh, literal, yeah. literally yeah <laughs> literally a lot, a lot of meanings there change of making some money change of music change of life um exactly yeah yeah working with a band that was already very successful and i uh, had a track record it was really about okay now you get like a touring situation going of like that was a real a real a real thing you know on that level had they already hit with like uh, the glow of love and stuff at that point or you yeah they had already they already hit with that and i'd actually played a couple of songs in some of the cover bands i was in before uh joining it and uh same thing you know that's ha happened along the way sometimes it's been pretty funny be playing uh playing the cover of the song and then actually getting to play with the artist. But, uh, you know, I, yeah, just did, so. I, I just did a show on change. I don't know if you're aware of that uh, just a couple of weeks I ago. Heard, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. You got to see what Timmy Allen and uh, uh, it was probably Rick Brennan. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and Toby, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So they were a lot of fun. Oh, they're a blast. You know, I, I really, uh, that was such a great way to really sort of start my, I'll call it my professional career. As, as a as a player there's really you know great great players great roadmates and uh you know we had a lot of fun playing together and just fun to hang out with them as well too so it was good you know between you know great friendship and uh you know really just locked together as you know, brothers in arms playing playing that music now, for for viewers can you explain there's sort of like two different uh changes in a way there was like the studio entity and then there was a touring entity, right? I mean, it was not that much crossover between those met people, or how did that work? Yeah, well, a lot of the players on the studio were all studio players, largely. And uh, for, for them being able to take the band out, they really, they need to put together something, you know, an, an entity in that, that respect. And some of the, some of the uh, 
think, I'm trying to think at that particular time. Uh, oh, no, you know, they really put together a new band from scratch, except uh, James Crab Robinson sang the leads on the second album, uh, which uh, was then he was already a voice and a part of uh, part of change there. Uh, that would have been um, Sharing Your Love. That album, James, James Crab Robinson sang uh, the male leads on Luther just just sang on the first uh, the first album, uh, Glow of Love. And on miracles, I got that right. Yeah. So, did you spend any studio time with Luther? Uh, actually, no, not until uh, "Dance with My Father," the last uh, his, his his last album before he passed away. Hmm. All those years, I never worked with him, and uh, I finally got the opportunity to uh, do some programming for him on that last album, wow. including "Dance with My Father." Yeah. But it must have been like after all this time, it's like a. Oh yeah, it's yeah. No, we had a, we had a, we had a great laugh about it. I said, <laughs> you know, I played and changed, and he was like, yeah, yeah. And uh, Lisa Fisher was was on the road with us and changed too, uh, who became uh, one of his main background singers. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so I think you were on three change albums. Is that right? Thereabouts. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, let's see. Uh, Turn on your radio. This is your time. And okay, change your heart. Change your heart. Ch change your heart. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, did you get interaction uh, at all with Jamie Lewis? Uh, no, not not in not in person. No, because they they put together basics with a couple of the guys, and then I came in later to do overdubs, and that was in Italy. So uh, they didn't have us all all there together at the same time. Mm. What was the first uh, track you paid, uh, played on, Jeff, where you got to hear either like on the radio or in a club or something like that? And you're like, hey, that's me. Oh, boy. Um, it had to be probably Change of Heart. Change of Heart. I think before that, in Miracles, oh, probably, yeah. Uh, oh, actually, no, this is your time. This is your time. Right, right. That would have been it. Yeah. So was that a kick or thrill for you? I mean, did you finally, did it click that, you know, you're finally definitely in this thing and this is my path? Yeah. Yeah. It really, really became real at that point. Yeah. I think with my, my first band, Flying Island, we, you know, we found ourselves in the jazz bins. At label. So that was really, we were so totally, you know, newbies. That was one of the first thrills, though we didn't get very much radio play, except on uh, 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 the New York Jazz Station, uh, where we got to hear ourselves there. But, um, but yeah, for a record hitting on that that level, it, it would have been been change. Well, even with F Flying Island, though, uh, Jeff, did you guys get to open for anybody? Nope, notable or uh, Larry Coriel, we opened for uh, Brecker Brothers, hmm. uh, Michael Urbaniak. Um, let's see who else in that world there. Jan Hammer, he opened up for that must have Jan been a thrill Hammer. for you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing. Yeah, wow. those are probably the most notables. Otherwise, we were usually featured ourselves. Uh, at that particular time, we could play, we could play jazz clubs as uh, you know, the main act. Yeah, hmm. so when you went to the studio though, and you started, you know, getting immersed in that you know were you pretty much just being handed parts and you know having to just read whatever it was or you came to you know put any of your own imprint on it or what was generally the the way things went well it evolved in different ways and it depended on the relationship i had uh early on a studio where dan hartman who had a great studio up in connecticut and we play on i think the first thing was a hilly michaels album and, uh, and then a neil sadaka album and he was producing. And uh, that was really, really specific ideas, what parts he wanted. I really needed to program the sound. And between the two of us, either was some, somebody like Dan was such a talented uh, musician. He, he, he knew exactly what he heard and he would play a part. Or he would just say, hey, you know, yeah, I want you to do a lay down a pad or do this kind of part and just work out ideas. So it was uh, really whatever, you know, fell into somebody's fingers, you know, the quickest there. And uh, yeah, I think in terms of 
synthesizer in the studio, Dan Hartman was really going to help me hone my skills in that way as, as a session synthesis. And, How much, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I was just uh, going to ask, you know, how much of you being up on the latest in keyboard technology kind of paved, you know, some inroads for you at that time? Oh, it was huge. You know, the cost of a polyphonic synthesizer with, uh, with a computer memory was exorbitant com compared to what other keyboards would have run. Uh, so, one, you had a very expensive, very exclusive instrument if you owned it, and then knowing how to program it. And uh, I had taken electronic music uh, through high school. I went to Greenwich High School. We had an electronic music lab. So all the way from, you know, 10th through 12th grade, we were working on, uh, we had an ARP 2500, ARP 2600, uh, an electric comp synth. So really some classic analog synthesizers plus uh, working with tape, you know, music concrete. So we kind of, we cover all the gamut of electronic music and creating our own, own sound. So later on, we'll get to use that the uh you know working the tape and in, in you know sampling and then actual synthesis working on the modular uh, synthesizers learning how to actually program sounds so I, I came in with that background already even though i never owned a synth for you know quite a few years after getting out of high school you were right in the thick of that sort of revolution of you know when the synthesizer became really mainstream and just ingrained in so many different you know forms of music popular music at that time yeah totally totally it was right there on the crest of it and it was a matter of well you either chose a prof profit five or an oberheim and those were sort of the two the two main instruments at that time that were pushing that then as the other companies came in uh as far as the computer-based uh, programmable synths and then uh it, it became like just a larger a larger uh synthesizer <laughs> landscape there yeah, you're, you're probably especially glad then that you uh, chose that path rather than the trumpet because the keys were were phasing out horns in so many instances. Indeed, they were. They certainly were. And what was great though was my my trumpet playing experience and experience playing in orchestra and understanding orchestration. All that came through in terms of uh, you know understanding how to you know program sounds and coming up with arrangement ideas and parts. So it really, uh, uh, really informed me really well at that time. Yeah. So Jeff, uh, how did you um, come to know Bill Laswell? Uh, after change, I was uh, I started playing with Nona Hendrix, her her, her uh, in her rock and roll band. She, after she was with Talking Heads, she put together some of the members of Talking Heads backup band. And was touring her, uh, touring with her own album, and uh, they had a keyboard slot open. And um, uh, again, it was a great situation. I went start touring with Nona, and uh, she was after about oh, I don't know, we were out about six months. She was starting a new album, and she was produced by Bill Laswell. So I met Bill, and I was playing a Rhodes Chroma at that time, in addition to uh, my Oberheim. And the Rhodes Chroma was uh, um, was one of Bill's instruments that he kept in the studio as well. So, uh, so I was. He saw. He noticed. You know, one that I was. You know, one of the few people who had a Chroma understood how to how to uh, uh, you know program it. So uh, from from the Nona, I went on. Uh, I got a call one day from uh, Herbie Hancock's uh, manager, and they were putting together a band. Uh, that you know, the bill had just uh, produced. Uh, was was that David, I'm sorry, was it David Rubinson or was it still uh, D David Rubinson? Yeah, was managing him. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, and Tony Myland was working with Herbie as well. So he was uh, Tony Myland was his day to day and kind of uh, creative muse as far as you know management and musical direction. But David was the uh, uh, you know had been you know his his manager all those all those years. And uh, and so uh, it was really just working with Bill with Nona Hendrix in the studio uh, and and doing some work there. He recommended me to uh, uh, to Herbie. What was your first impression of, of Bill? Oh, Bill was one just a very articulate, uh, such a innovative thinker and 
came in from a whole different perspective. Uh, he was really, to me, you know, very life-changing producer to work with. And uh, I, I got to work with him for quite a few years on a lot of different albums um, that, that I just, you know, really, that was where I felt like I could really, you know, be creative outside of the, the, the pop world and learned a lot, learned a lot from him. Yeah. What, is there anything that you can describe about his approach or his manner in the studio that facilitates, you know, that sort of experimentation and just the type of output he gets from the music, musicians that he's worked with? Well, it's, it's fascinating because he had a way of directing you, but not directing you. And just say, you know, just kind of describe the zone he wants you to play in. And uh, whatever I was playing on most of these, he already had an existing basic track going. So uh, the setup was already there. So it was really, uh, really left a lot of space just to, to respond to the music and, uh, and, and work with it. And if you were in the right direction, he would just kind of give you a nod and, you know, that kind of a kind of look and you're good. Otherwise, he just, you know, it kind of helps steer you, you know, a little different direction. So it, it was great. You felt like you were really uh, contributing to something, yet he was really, uh, you know, sailing the ship, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. How much of that work would have multiple players in the studio at once, you know, or was everyone coming and going or were people together? Or? Now, for myself, it was usually uh, uh, on my own with him. He'd already like laid down a basic and we would just sit down and go through a number of tracks that he had already prepared. So that was usually how it worked. And um, I think any of the things that he had William Burroughs had done narrations on, there was already like a narration on. So I got to hear really the, sort of the core creative hurdle of what was going on and then uh, work from there. And then sometimes it'd be totally mysterious. It would just be a groove and a bass line. It wouldn't know what it was going to be until... Well after, uh, well after the you know record came out, so, would, would he tell you I want you to take this in kind of a, a rocky way or a jazzy way or a funky way or? Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, he, he might. Uh, you know, he says I'm going to have Bernie, uh, Bernie Morel play on it, so we don't want to get too much in his his place, but let's just get textural, atmospheric, which was a place he asked me to go to go to a lot, just to create the atmosphere there, and then in terms of a real, you know, groove and pocket stuff. That would be like Bernie Royal or some, someone like that on, on, uh, on the regular, you know, traditional keys. How much exposure or uh, interaction did you have with Bernie Royal then or in your career? Oh, uh, really? It was through Bill. So it was, uh, uh, I'm trying to think we ever, I don't know if we ever, played, we might play it on a Pharrell Sanders album at the same time. I think it was Pharrell Sanders was the, was, the one and only time I ever got to be in the room playing in the, uh, in the group live in the studio uh, with Bernie. Otherwise, uh, you know, either he had already laid down his parts in the basic and I was overdubbing or, uh, or vice versa, where I was just helping Bill lay down the uh, uh, sort of the container for whatever was going to happen, you know, afterward musically. As a, you know, keyboard peer, you know, how did you view what Bernie brought to the table? Oh, I mean, he was the, the master of both funk, the groove. Uh, I mean, he he played and programmed a mini mood like no one else. I mean, he got things that you just such unexpected, you know, sounds and, and just approaches that were just, you know, just amazing. You know, it's, it's hard to, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's just just brilliant. I mean, uh, and uh, his Hammond playing on top of him, his his clav playing, clavinet playing was uh, was absolutely stunning too. So again, it's uh, you know somebody who I really uh, you know admired, and uh, was an honor to be able to play keyboards in the same uh, uh, you know project with him in that respect. And it was the same thing with with Herbie because I, I was more familiar with Herbie because of my jazz rock background, and uh, they get the opportunity to to be on the same stage with Herbie and be his, uh, basically his, his second keyboard player uh, was just amazing. Uh, we used to, you know, within the band, we used to always say, you know, this is every night is a, is a uh, you know, a lesson in, you know, we're, we're learning all new things from the master every night. 
and uh, you know it was uh, it was really going to school. You were on the right. rocket tour, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 So, and you guys, I know you guys went to Japan because they actually released a video of that. But where did that tour take you in total? Uh, it took us to Europe, uh, all parts of Europe. Um, um, yeah, we were through, uh, you know, Germany, France, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and uh, uh, Sweden, and the UK. Those were our main uh, main places we'd always be returning to most of the time with Herbie. And then Japan, it would be countrywide, you know, doing festivals or standalone, you know, full concerts. Uh, yeah, so that was our main thing. And then the States, of course. Did, did Herbie like to rehearse or was he just like, let's go do it? Uh, well, for this music, it was really important to rehearse because we were, we were playing, um, uh, you know, the, the, kind, the kind of music was really, you know, you, you, were, you were playing and using the sounds that were what the record was. So it, was, it wasn't like jazz where you, know, you, you have the basic instrument and you have the, the freedom to open up the, the uh, you know, the arrangements and things like that. It was really uh, very well rehearsed in that respect. We had our the places where we stretched the chorus live and even, you know, the, uh, the, XD, the uh, DS, DST, the uh, DJ uh, was, was always, he was a soloist as well, you know, with the turntables. So uh, we, we, had, we had that space to, to move with. But as far as the actual pieces go off the record, you know, we needed to, uh, you know, play the parts you know, as, as written as far as all the main, the main grooves and all that, melodies and everything. And Bernard Fowler took care of vocals, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you feel on stage, Jeff, uh, at that point? You know, were you as comfortable performing as you were in the studio? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was uh, on a stage like that with that kind of a band. It was just, you know, it was all, it was all there for you. It really, uh, really just, you know, you were allowed to shine with Herbie. He even gave me a, uh, a like a solo spot. And we, uh, in, in Chameleon, there's some excerpts online where uh, I think it was in Japan where you actually see us do, uh, do solos and we we're trading, trading eights and fours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great wow. fun. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what did you uh, learn from Herbie that you kind of took with you? Do you think? Oh, a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, you begin one, I mean, just seeing his approach as a player and his touch was just something. It's just, I just felt like I absorbed it. He, uh, and he told us a lot of, a lot of stories uh, of his experience with Miles Davis, because Miles Davis was in so many ways his, his mentor. And some of the things were like, don't practice. <laughs> you know, you're, you know, you, you, you practice on stage. I think there was a, uh, Miles' story along those ways, where uh, Miles, they were walking down the hall and they heard one of the sax, sax players practicing his, his part or solo, and Miles knocking on the door and telling him, you know, stop practicing. You know, you, you practice on the gig. That's where it all happens. Uh, you know, so uh, it's all those little bits of wisdom that, that we learned from Herbie. And, you know, his openness to all kinds of music, his appreciation of also uh, acoustic music and electronic, all things computer-based. Uh, I mean, going to the studio with Herbie and watching him go in at the time, digital performer, and in there changing velocities of notes, all these little things are going like, he doesn't have to do that. He's such an amazing player. But he would get in there and he would just tweak away and all that and uh, taught me a lot, which you know brought to the studio to have the patience to really just really look at stuff, listen to it, and... Uh, and fine tune, you know, performance at that level. Yeah. Well, just so you know where I'm coming from, Jeff. I mean, Herbie Hancock and Bernie Worrell, definitely two of my all-time favorite keyboard players. So, yeah, yeah, no, and mine too, and even more so with with uh, after working with them. You know, you know, it's one thing you're you're on equal turf as far as professionals go, but uh, you know, holding you know those those guys in such such respect for their talent and who they are in the world as, as musicians and what they bring to their craft to me is uh, uh, in a way even more important than the, the, uh, the actual playing that they do because uh, it's through them to me as the music uh, comes 
through them in, in not such a way who they really are down at, you know, at, at the heart level. I was so glad too that Bill Laswell uh, gave Bernie Orell a space to like explore and do all kinds of stuff post Parliament Funkadelic, you know, and uh, yeah. and also with Herbie, he helped completely revitalize his career again and and put him on yet a, a different you know type of music path. So I mean, he was Absolutely. key in just you know reinvigorating those guys. Absolutely, absolutely. And even bringing, working with Bill and bringing a lot of the work I did with him into my pop work uh, in terms of use of, you know, sampling and, and manipulating uh, and working with different genres of music. And, uh, uh, you know, it, that, that especially was, was not being afraid of just saying, hey, you know, I'm working on a pop record, but I can dig into some Gustav Mahler here and bring in something that's some epic classical sounds and, and soundscapes in this, in this mother music, or uh, especially, I think, probably around, uh, you know, uh, you know well, I guess the best place, I could, best way I could say is really uh, world music, international artists, and really appreciating what they do in some of the, uh, you know, traditional instruments and how uh, working with parts and, and, and the music really help impact, you know, the, the modern pop world as well. Yeah, I mean, what I like also about Bill Laswell is, I mean, he challenges even my sensibilities at times because he just goes there, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, every session I knew, I said, I don't know what I'm going to be in for, but it's going to be really, uh, you know, a journey, whatever that might be. And, uh, you know, and it's great, though, because he had, you know, to me, he had this really... Uh, you know, quiet sort of sense of humor, you know, when you're doing something that was really quirky and unique and just taking things so totally to other space, it would just kind of give you like a knowing look, like, see, cool, right? This is really <laughs> going to yeah, you know. I think uh, it was one album we did with a uh, Chinese vocalist, first time I ever heard it. Uh, sorry, I don't remember the artist's name. But it was brilliant to hear uh, a traditional Chinese vocalist over like funk tracks. I mean, that was just at the time, you know, who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. And for the Herbie project, did you interact at all with Michael Bainhorn? Oh, yeah, as well. Yeah. Actually, I have to add him with the uh, uh, actually, well, see, Bill, I think Bill worked mm, not a whole lot with Michael then. I worked with Michael with Nona Hendrix. Michael and Bill were. Uh, deeply involved together at that time. And it seemed after I was in uh, the, the Herbie world, I don't know if those guys were going down their own paths production-wise at that point. So most of my work at that point was uh, was with Bill once I was uh, with Herbie. And Nona Hendrix, I mean, another one that just takes chances and goes for it big time, you know, and, and great singer too. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it was great performing with her because it was – it was the spirit of, uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, her energy and, and having all like the, the Talking Heads backup band as, as her band. I mean, it was just, the groove was just so killer. It was, I, I couldn't say enough about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, how did you parlay, you know, the success and experience you had with, with Laswell and Herbie and in that, you know, period of your career into, you know, growing, expanding into other projects? Well, at that point, being a Herbie's backup keyboard player, uh, it was like, well, you know, you must be pretty good if you can play with Herbie. And so I started getting a lot of gigs. So, oh, yeah, he's, he's Herbie's guy. And I started playing on a lot, lot of pop records. Uh, and that's when mid 80s, I was, I was getting all the calls from like Cindy Locker. Uh, Billy Joel, David Lee Roth, uh, Robert Palmer, and working with Robert Palmer opened up the door to me working with Bernard Edwards at that time and working on a lot of Bernard's productions and then eventually playing in a band with, with Bernard. Uh, so that my entree into that, that world was really, it was due to, you know, the, uh, the Herbie gig. It really opened up the doors for me there. Um, if, if we're looking at that period, Jeff, you know, say like mid mid to late 80s, 
What are a couple of the projects that really stand out to you that were just really special or you felt really enjoyed or felt really good about? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Robert Palmer, Riptide album, Addicted to Love, Discipline of Love, all those songs. That was amazing to work on. Uh, did it down at Compass Point and the experience of being in the studio, live cutting tracks and, uh, and or just putting the, putting the tracks together, whether it was one at a time or being all in the same room. And plus, uh, we had a thing every night before we were going to cut a new song. We'd go to Robert's uh, apartment, which was right across the street from uh, Compass Point Studios, and just talk through the song. And Robert would just let us know what he was looking for. Bernard would, would kind of translate and kind of bring things into a place where what we were going to do the next day. So uh, uh, it was really such a creative you know, community and space to be in. You know, it was really, uh, really amazing. That was that was a really amazing record to work on. And while you're working on it, you know, there's something so special about this. You can never tell, but you knew this record was going to be uh, going to turn into really something even on, on a larger scale than I think even Robert had anticipated at the time, you know, with the, with the Power Station album being out and kind of bringing the spotlight back onto Robert and, and what he did. Yeah, uh, and, and such a uh, video sensation, too, back then. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But, you and know, before, another, before you go on, Jeff, I got to say, oh, sure. uh, everyone who's been on who talks about working with Robert Palmer loved the experience. I mean, yeah. I had Eddie Martinez on. Uh, um, oh, you did? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think he might have mentioned it, it being his favorite live show was one of the Robert Palmer ones in Europe or something. So, yeah, yeah. yeah and Eddie, Eddie and I were first introduced uh, when I was playing with Nona. Uh, obviously Eddie had already played New Nona through LaBelle and I don't know what other uh, versions of uh, you know, bands that uh, Nona had worked in. So uh, later on, come together with Eddie on the Robert Palmer album. That was that was brilliant. It was great to see how everything sort of, everybody's paths kind of came together in different ways there. And, uh, you know, Eddie to this day is one of my favorite guitar players to play with. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah the um also in fact i've worked with eddie it was bill see we were eddie was in the bill Laswell world as well um the ryoichi sakamoto album i think it's 1988 was uh, called neo geo we all played on the album and we toured in japan with ryoichi sakamoto and that was an amazing experience that was really amazing who was playing drums on that uh that was david palmer who was with ABC, I think, at the time. Yeah, eventually became Rod Stewart's drummer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can still see some of the shows uh, online on, on YouTube of uh, Sakamoto. But it was one of the things uh, of, of New York rock, or let's say an international rock rhythm section. And then uh, there was a sitarist and... Um, uh, three Okinawan singers, folk singers, who played. Uh, 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 oh, geez, I'm trying to think of the name. I can't think of the name of the instrument right off the top of my head. But uh, but played played traditional in instruments. So it was this really very cool mix of of world and Sakamoto electronica and uh, and funk. Mm. It was all all together. Bernard Fowler was on that as well. So we were all kind of part of this traveling musical family through that part of our careers through the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, so besides Robert Palmer, though, I think you were going to go on to one or two others. Uh, like yes. Uh, well, at the same time, mid 80s, I got introduced to Jim Steinman. And I worked on, uh, Jim was doing his own album called Pandora's Box, which included the song, It's All Coming Back to Me Now which was originally created uh, at that time with uh, a New York singer named Elaine Caswell singing the lead on it. And Ellen Foley sang, uh, sang on the album and uh, a couple other singers. It was like uh, four women singers. And, uh, and it was really, it was Jim's next big statement. That was like around 86. And the album came out in the UK, didn't really do all that great. He had one video that was really so edgy uh, they couldn't show it in the, in the States at that particular time. 
uh, a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of bondage and some other things in the video. That was just a little, a little too much for the uh, MTV uh, sensors at that particular point. But uh, it's all coming back to me. I ended up being, uh, we did later for Russell Dion. That Steinman album was epic because uh, that to me, that's where I got to bring my uh, real orchestration chops and arranging chops to what he, uh, what he did because the, uh, everything was bigger. You know, every song got bigger and bigger and you just went as big as you could go. So it really required uh, just the, the skills of, you know, how you blended things, how you had parts work together. And the songs, his songs were typically really long, you know, six, seven, eight minutes. So to really keep an arrangement interesting and build and, uh, but still really, you know, support the songs, uh, really had to like bring a lot, really had to hone my arranging orchestration skills there. Uh, How long did that take in the studio? Well, that was, that album was, that was probably a year, around a year in, in the studio with him. A, a lot of work and it was still analog tape at the time. So that added a bit of time to uh, doing the works, programming and sequencers, but then, uh, you know, having to print all the parts to tape. And, and that way that, that just added a lot of time to the process at the time. But that was the only thing we knew at, at that particular time. Uh, uh, you know, fast forward to the Meatloaf Bad Out of Hell 2 album. That was about two and a half years in the making mm. with that process. Yeah. All his records took forever, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the detail and the amount of uh, work that went into them was uh, was very deep. And I've kind of taken that piece with me, too, is leave no stone unturned and really support the song. You know, that that's uh, uh, that's one of the biggest lessons I took about, you know, took from there was, uh, was, was all about the song. Although, you know, it's still... We, we do that today, think of that way in pop, but that was where I think I really was shown the, the importance of that, really getting deep into it. Because as a player, I can say, oh, yeah, I come up with a cool part for this song. It's something that works with the track. But then this was, again, going even deeper for me in terms of my own growth as a musician and uh, arranger. When you were getting in projects like that, involved, immersed in projects like that, um, did it keep you off the road or did you still find ways to get that in there? I did for a little while, but it, it ended up, I was so busy doing the session work uh, that, you know, just special gigs would come up, like Ryuichi Sakamoto or something like that. That was a, a short period of time. I, I, could, I could go out and it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't hurt my, uh, my work in town. But it was, it was by yeah, 88, 89 at that point. I was really uh, then sort of committed to being in New York uh, in the studio. So I, I really went out very rarely. And it would usually be with like maybe an artist that I worked on their album and they were doing a few like key showcases, uh, no long-term turning, touring that I would uh, work with. Um, I did some tours with Ryuichi Sakamoto's ex-wife, uh, uh, Akiko Yano, uh, where she had like Will Lee on bass, Chris Parker on drums, those guys, and uh, did some tours with her. But those were usually a shorter, you know, th uh, three, four weeks with rehearsals and, and the gigs. Uh, did you get to do any TV performances? Uh, let's see. Well, TV wise, well, well, I think the first really real TV gig was uh, probably with Herbie Saturday Night Live. Ringo Starr was the uh, hmm. was the guest host, and then uh, I think I played with Vanessa Williams on uh, Good Morning America. Did, yeah, did, did a couple of Ken Mo appearances. Uh, Doug Wembish with Doug Wembish, and uh, yeah. And Doug's been on the show. Oh, great. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I want viewers to uh, know that uh, when we mentioned some of those artists, specifically the David Lee Roth was Eat Him and Smile. That was a huge hit uh, album. And um, Billy Squire, Enough is Enough. True Colors was Cindy Opera, one of her biggest. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Um, and that one's been like redone many times even since then. It's like sort of a, yeah. a standard almost. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. That album was was interesting because it was the first time she was working with the whole concept of doing programming, mixing programming with live in the studio, and uh, 
she'd been working with Jimmy Braylauer, the drum, drum programmer, and uh, they were cutting things all very piecemeal in the studio, except when the band would cut things live. And they were they found they kept recutting things until they really got the tracks right. And so he suggested to her, "Why don't we come in and?" Uh, we got introduced and said, look, we can come in, we can program, uh, pre-program the songs and get the arrangements together. So you could, you had a reference and you could either lay the band on top of it or build, build the songs, you know, from the ground up that way. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we started on, uh, yeah, it would have been change of heart, actually speaking of change of heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the first one we 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 sort of tested with her, and uh, that's where the it's got the sequence bass line, and all the since that the core keyboard parts we we programmed first in the studio with the basic drum parts, and then laid uh, laid all that down once it was all worked out laid that down onto tape, and then uh, now Rogers came in and played the guitar uh, on that yeah. You also uh, are credited with Jody Watley. That's right. That's when I was with uh, Bernard Edwards, working uh, working on his productions. And you know, we cut we cut that in L.A. What hits were on that one? Oh, <laughs> there was a there's a bunch of you know. all our, all our hits, right? Or that's the first one. That first album, yeah. Um, yeah, what was it? I'm looking for a new love. Is it? Yep, yep. That one played on that. In fact, that was. Uh, that was the lead smash hit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been uh, is that the Larger Than Life album. Yeah, Real Love, What You Can Do For Me, and uh, let's see what else we got there. Um, that was produced by Andre Simone? Yeah, he was executive producer, but they passed, uh, they passed uh, I think, like Real Love onto Bernard. I'm trying to think of some other... Uh, the period as well. Well, David Lee Roth, uh, I was working on True Colors. David Lee Roth was recording uh, uh, recording at the same time with Billy Joel. And I was in Power Station. And I ended up through word of mouth between the studios getting recommended to play on this. So that's actually how I was working with Cindy. That's how I ended up with uh, working on Billy Joel, meeting Phil Ramone, which I ended up working on a lot of projects with Phil. And, uh, and then I ended up playing on David Lee Roth, Eat Him and Smile. Yeah, so it was, that was, uh, to me, that was the classic uh, power station uh, time where you just went from studio to studio, you know, working with all the different artists. That so was really a, a great moment. And musically, it seems like that was sort of where you were coming from with uh, the group of your own, the Distance Project, right? Yeah, yeah. I was mixing the rock and the funk. And... Um, yeah, we brought a lot of our roots in there. And then uh, also, yeah, like, especially like, you know, the English rock side of it, that influence uh, came in there. And then just a great rock and funk rock, you know, bottom to the track with Bernard and Tony Thompson. Yeah. Which was so, amazing playing with those guys. Yeah. 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 Did you actually get to perform uh, at all? Go out for that? or We never, did... we never, we never went out. We never went out on it. Yeah. Yeah. Just all, all in the studio. Yeah. And, and how did you guys feel about, you know, how it was supported or not supported or, you know, what? We, we were, we were, we were not happy. It, it just, we weren't getting the, the, again, the traction we really wanted to get. And uh, it was, dis it was disappointing, especially with, with the lineup that we had. So, so uh, super group of sorts. Yeah, Absolutely. And that might have been again the timing when you know the super group was the super rock and roll group was starting to to move in, in towards uh, you know alternative rock and stuff like that. So there was a change on, and uh, you know in certain ways maybe we were just at the back end of that. Yeah, yeah, it was right before gr grunge didn't come too long after that. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Um, I want to mention oh, this is uh, Steve Salas, Stevie Salas. You've worked with, who's been on the show also. So, oh yeah. yeah, it's like you're part of that clique. I think you know with Bernard, both Bernards and uh, Stevie, and you know uh, Eddie and 
Absolutely. You know, yeah. it's that circle, that sort of, uh, I'll call it like the soul group of musicians that, uh, you know, we all recommend each other projects that we work on. We, we kind of know who we've worked with that, you know, could really bring something, really bring something to projects. So we're always, uh, you know, supporting each other in that way as well. So, you guys, you guys sort of in doing that, I would think bring some of the chemistry of almost like a group has because you already have that familiarity with each other when you get on projects. Sure. sure, totally. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's a great point. Yeah. 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 Stevie, Stevie's just incredible too. I mean, that that's uh yeah, I'm gonna say, you know, again with all these players, they all have this this place where they bring their craft in such a way that uh you know just working on on their music and getting their perspective just bring so much to like, again, my own, uh, you know, my own growth and exploration and, and expansion as a player. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.